What do you find? You, you mentioned earlier on, we're talking about rheumatoid arthritis is similar to multiple sclerosis in the fact that we just have a slightly different modification on the cells that are being attacked. And you said, but the root, the treatment is the same for all of them. What do you find? Wh- how do you, what is the mechanism by which you think we should treat autoimmune diseases? I take a gut centric approach. So I, I first did a lecture years ago when I first met you over in Denver and it was electron lectins. And just before I presented that, I came across this lovely research paper. It was a genome wide association study looking at the connectivities between different types of autoimmune disease and seeing how they related to each other. And the thing that struck home was that the inflammatory bowel diseases things like celiac disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, that was basically at the centre of the big wheel. And all these other autoimmune diseases were circling around the edges. And I think that sort of fits with our understanding molecule, understanding of the pathological basis of autoimmune disease. Essentially, uh, I'll try and simplify it in a nutshell, but one of the major causes is that if we consume certain foods that contain the same kind of barcode as some of our cells naturally do, and for some reason our body comes to react to those foods and say, hey, you're a foreign invader, then when it attacks the proteins on those foods, it can then also has the potential to attack the glycoproteins on our cells. Now, those chemicals are called lectins, they're carbohydrate binding proteins. And one of the ways which they can be exposed to our immune system is if the normal mechanisms by which our gut digests and break down foods isn't working properly. So some of these little proteins or peptides coming across, they're meant to be chopped up into tiny pieces that are non-reactive. If they're coming across into clumps, we've got something called leaky gut, inflammatory bowel disease, so on and so forth, then they can actually cross over the wall of our gastrointestinal tract, reach an area called the lamina propria, where our immune system is surveilling for foreign pathogens, and we can create this cross-reaction, and we call it molecular mimicry, and this is quite well established. So I think addressing the gut is the first thing. Just to make the point, though, this is not the sole cause of autoimmune disease. It is a significant cause. We know that genetics interacts and we know that certain other environmental factors such as infections also interact. So having said that, genetics isn't the cause of autoimmune disease. I think genetics can load the gun, but it's usually environmental factors which will then pull the trigger. And that will be things like diet. Now, just to briefly talk of something I haven't ever really talked about before, is that we've actually got evidence that you might actually, this dietary exposure could also be considered to loading the gun, and then you might get an infection which effectively loads the, pulls the trigger. So I talked to you before about how we've got these barcodes on our cells, they're called glycoproteins. So basically a little protein stalk with a little carbohydrate cap on it, which is where the barcode is. Now, usually that's actually got a protective cap over the top of it. And it's something we call a sialic acid residue. And even if you had antibodies or proteins coming around that could read that barcode, this protective buffer cap on the top will stop it getting to it. We've got very good evidence that certain infections and infections that we know, streptococcus, that are often assumed to be a trigger of autoimmune disease, they can actually strip off this sialic sialic acid residue, this buffer coating on top of the glycoprotein, thereby exposing the barcode to these proteins that are made by the immune system. So it's not just a matter of what you eat will pull the trigger, but it's definitely a major contributor. And the way I like to think about it, it's the thing that we have the most control over. It's very difficult to change your parents as an adult, and it's difficult to limit what infections you get, but we can control what we eat. And in that respect, I think that's probably the most important factor. It's also important to understand that these antibodies that we've got circulating around triggering autoimmune issues, they have a long life. And just because you stop eating something today doesn't mean that they've gone tomorrow. The antibodies against celiac disease, for instance, we know that they can live for up to 18 months in the blood, 15, 18 months, no problem. So 
you can still have this tendency for autoimmune reactivity for more than 12 months after you've cleaned up your diet. It takes that long. Even if you can stop producing them, you still got to wait for the other ones to wash out. Yeah, fascinating stuff, Paul, because I don't know what you're up to these days. Are you still seeing actively have, have a full practice seeing patients? Are you focusing more on research or what are you doing day to day these days? I'm sort of mixed. So I'm in the clinic a few days and muck around in theatres and I, I don't know if I've got a special interest in spinal pain. So I think spinal pain is just as mismanaged as nutritional medicine. So I'm in the middle of writing a, a large thesis on that at the moment, trying to revise and turn on the head the standard management for low back and spinal pain. But absolutely, I'm in the clinic. And to be fair, that's where I do most of my learning. I'm still learning from patients every day. But the thing about my patients is they're incredibly well educated. And if there's something out there on the interwebs um, that's new and interesting, they'll ask me about it. And, and if I haven't learned about it, then they encourage me to go and figure it out. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think you can underestimate the benefits of a clinical practice just for me driving my education. So for all my patients, thank you. Yeah, it, it is. And you think about the early days of medicine, you learned everything from your patients. And now we kind of dismissed. <laughs> they, we don't know what's going on. It still amazes me. We'll have gastroenterologists who will say Crohn's disease has nothing to do with diet. I'm baffled by that sort of thing. Do you find, what are you seeing in your practice right now? Because you you're a sports medicine guy by training, if I'm not mistaken. So that would, autoimmune disease would not be high on the priority typically for that typical practice. But what does your day-to-day -day patient load look like these days? It's, it's a mix. Sure, coming in for sports medicine, they don't think they've got any inflammatory bowel disease. But we know that a lot of these joint pains, I tend, I guess I see a lot of patients are complex patients. I'm known as the guy who sorts stuff out when he's been through seven specialists and they haven't been able to get to the bottom of it yet. So if you've got somebody with a weird kind of joint pain, it's frequently autoimmune. And we get them up on the bed. We have a quick fill of their abdomen. We say, well, you've got some pain where you shouldn't have pain. We run some tests. So, you know, my favorite tests now, one of the ones that is coming to the fore is the eosinophil cationic protein. And we run a few other of these tests and we say, well, this is quite high. And funnily enough, what we think is a straight up orthopedic problem actually turns out to be an autoimmune issue. But my major caseload is people coming in with everything from dementia, joint pain, back pain, diabetes, weight issues. It's a full gamut. It's certainly not a sport-centric practice anymore. I do some consulting for some teams and stuff, which I won't say too much about, but it's basically a general physician now, just seeing physician elite kind of things. Yeah. And are you seeing things that are amenable to diet that years past where you've never thought they have anything to do like i saw a lady with tourette's syndrome that tourette's went away she changed her diet and her tourette's went away and it was something that i would have never 10 years ago i would have never thought that tourette's had a role in diet or any significant role in it, it completely resolved are you seeing any sort of weird conditions that diet have, has an impact on oh absolutely even something like hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or something we, we tend to see in athletes and we say, oh, that's an insulin-related condition or DISH, diffuse idiopathic scleral hyperostosis. It's, oh, that's related to very high levels of insulin. So there's just, the weird thing is, I, I'm just baffled that I didn't click earlier, that somehow I thought that in medical school when the, we're learning pharmacology and they say, you've got this issue, you take this molecule and that will interact with that, that somehow I, I didn't think that we're actually not that clever that we can actually hack the human body. We sort of need to go back to the basics and see how the human body is put together and how it's actually meant to work. Yeah. And I just baffled. Yeah. So what percentage of the patients that you see now uh, get some kind of nutritional prescription, whether it's a carnivore diet, a ketogenic diet, a paleo diet, a cut out sugars and grain, processed food diet. How often are you using diet with your patients? Is it pretty much everyone or how does it work? 90%. Yeah. And how is that received? Like maybe some people seek you out because they know that's what they're going to get. Or do you still have a lot of just kind of random people coming in and you tell well, them? thing yeah. that gives me a lot of pleasure, Sean. I think you could probably relate. Because I'm known as a difficult kind of patient guy, I tend to see a certain group of patients who have these poorly, really vague symptoms of fatigue and lethargy and general unwellness who are frequently vegan and vegetarian. Mm. 
And a lot of them, they don't look me up before they come in. They just come in on their doctor's recommendation and they really don't know that they're walking into a bear's den. (laughs) And so once we start talking about diet, and genuinely shocked. And I said, well, I think you could be having some autoimmune inflammations. And, you know, and, and we don't always just look at diet. We're having a, two weathers of horribly wet weather here in Sydney. So we're seeing a lot of mold reactions here at the moment. And that presents very similarly to some of the autoimmune dietary issues. But once we go through it, these people genuinely have never heard of it before. And it's quite exciting for me because I get to go back to basics and I get to explain to them and take them through it. Do try and be empathic and caring when we do it. And you just sort of see the light bulb go off in their head. And it's absolutely fantastic. And when they actually make that connection that, number one, that what they're eating is possibly contributing to their symptoms, but number two there's something they can do about it and it's incredibly empowering for them. And as a doctor, I I think you'll agree it's most satisfying. Yeah, I'm very fortunate that the people that I interact with generally want to change their diet. In fact, they come to me specifically to do that, to get guidance on that. So it makes it very easy because you have a motivated patient. When you're taking the normal physician encounter, people come to you because not because they want to, because they have to. They're like, I broke my leg. I got to come see the doctor. That wasn't on their schedule and they're not happy to see you, but now it's it's very different. Let me ask. Sean, there's two types of patients. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think this is just distraction, but interesting. There's two types of patients. There's the patients who come to you and say, doctor, what can I take? And there's the patients who come to you and say, doctor, what can I do? And funnily enough, there's two different types of doctors that seem to marry up with those patients almost perfectly. And I always want to be the what can I do kind of doctor and not the what can I take kind of doctor. And our job, I think, is when we've got the what can I take patient, is our job is one of education. Latin, the doctor in Latin is to teach. Mm. So I think our job is to bring them along for the ride. Can you, I mean, a lot of sort of belief around they're going to demonize one thing for Gary Tobbs, it's sugar. Sugar in the diet is clearly the downfall of man. There's other people say, no, it's all seed oils and sugar is innocent. There's other people like I look at it and I say, well, that's, those are ingredients in processed food. Maybe it's just a hyper-processed food. Is there an ingredient that we have to be all, can we say sugar is fine, just don't eat seed oils? Or can we say it's all about sugar? Or how do you look at that? Is it just the entire industrialized diet that's garbage and we got to get it all out of it? Or is there one ingredient that's a big problem? I think there's a hierarchy. For my money, I think seed oils are probably the most deleterious. And we do have some evidence that shows that when seed oils exceed about 6% of the diet by intake, then they seem to be more problematic than the amount of sugar that we're consuming. And I've talked about that paper in some of my lectures. And just think for a second that the average Australian consumes double that amount of seed oil energy in their diet. So I think seed oils is the worst, but you have to understand that there's an interaction between seed oils and sugar. For example, in the rose corn oil study, they actually found that they were looking at people's urine and they found that they developed sugar in their urine when they fed them seed oils. Uh, So there's this, the interaction of seed oils and sugars is terribly problematic. Now, I think there's also a metabolic health stage of this. I think seed oils are bad for everybody, but I think that sugar in small amounts, and I don't want to be one of these calorie counters in moderation, I think that's complete bollocks. But I think if somebody's young and metabolically healthy and exercising, and they have a small amount of sugar, then I think that's actually probably their body's going to handle that perfectly fine. And I often recommend to my patients who are struggling with cheats, because we can talk about food cravings and the mechanisms for that if you want, but basically people who are struggling with cheats, and we do know that for a period of time until we correct certain factors, they're going to be having these cravings. I recommend that they cheat with pure sugar Mm. rather than things like pastries and cakes. The idea being that when you're having sugar and fructose, you're getting this metabolic hit to your body, but in a controlled amount, you'll get over that usually. You might put on a few grams of weight, but what have you. But if you're having something like a croissant with gluten in it, then that can trigger an autoimmune response and that autoimmune response can be prolonged and persistent as we talked about with the longevity of the immune antibodies in your blood. So I'm actually, yes, sugar is bad in the quantities that we're having it, but I think if you're going to have a little bit of a tweet, I actually say to my patients, if you're going to go have a tweet, have a boil, have a cheat, have a boiled lolly, Mm. you know, have some pure sugar, have a toffee. That's going to be far better for you than going to a bakery. 